the best date you can think of was with your spouse. And uh, maybe, maybe you're here this morning and you're like, man, I, I'd just be happy to have a date. And so, so but what, what was the best date you ever went on? So welcome to Vernonia Church. My name is Sam. I'm the pastor here, and I have the privilege to be able to, to share every week here at the church. And, and I just love preaching here. I love being a part of this church body. It's just a fun church to work with. And we're going to dive into this new series where we're talking about best relationships because we believe God wants you to have the best relationships you could possibly have. God wants the best possible life for you. He wants you to have the best possible walk with Him. He wants you to have the best possible friendships, the best possible marriage, the best possible family. He wants that for you. And maybe you're here this morning and you're thinking, well, you know, my closest relationships, they aren't really all that they should be. In fact, probably all of us would say that that all of us have relationships that could be better. All of us have relationships that, that could use a little bit of God's touch in them. All of us maybe have found that there are times where if we have our closest relationships and they're out of sorts, our life can get a little out of sorts. Maybe it's a relationship with a spouse, and if it's not quite where it should be, we feel a little off. Maybe it's a relationship with a friend, and, and, and that relationship, there's a strain there, and, and we, we just need to, to, to have God help us out with that. Or maybe it's a relationship with a brother, a sister, a son, a, a parent, whatever it is, we all could probably say, you know, we could use better relationships. We could use some advice from God, some help from God and how to have the best relationship possible. There's a theme verse that we're going to come back to throughout this series. In fact, if you have your programs that you got when you came in, there's a note sheet in there. Pull that out. That's a great place for you to take notes on what we talk about. That's a great place for you to jot down some thoughts. Maybe God will but put something in your heart or in your mind to write down. And you'll notice on the front of that, there's a verse. And it's going to be a verse we'll come back to over and over again. But it's a verse in Psalm 32, verse 8. It says this, The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathways for your life. That's what God wants to do for you. I want to guide you along the best pathway for your life. And I will advise you and I will watch over you. And God wants you to have the best possible life, and that includes your relationships. When I think of uh, the, the date that stands out the most to me, I think of the first date I went on with Carrie. Growing up, I, I grew up in, in a non-Christian home. I grew up as not a Christian, and, and, and if anybody ever brought me home for a date, like if I was the dad, I would have not been happy to have this kid, this punk kid hanging out with my daughter. I, I, I'd have been, you know, checking the shotgun shells and, and making sure everything was in order. But, but later, I, I became a Christian later in my, 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 my teen life, and I started dating from a whole different perspective with a lot of different things on my heart and my mind. And I don't know about you, but I went through the pain of, 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 of breaking up, of getting broken up with, of being dumped. I went through the pain of, of, of all that, giving my heart away and, and then having it ripped up and tore up. And, and then I went through a time where I was just like, hey, I'm just going to have a good time and go on lots of dates with lots of people because that was what I wanted to do. And it was sort of in that season where I met Carrie and we became friends. And, and when I went on a, for my first date with Carrie, I thought it was just going to go have a good time with somebody and and whatever. So I invited her. I said, what are you doing tonight? And she said, I don't know. What should I be doing? And I said, well, you're going with me to Red Lobster, and we're going to go on a date. And I was in college and didn't have a lot of money, so Red Lobster was like, I'm just going out there, you know? And we went to Red Lobster. We went on this date, and I discovered this person that I was just, I did not dis- expect to discover. This person who I fell in love with, this person who had a lot of depth to her, who had faith, who was going to encourage me to, and challenge me to grow. And I was excited to be with this person. So we spent like two hours talking in Red Lobster. And, and everybody had left. And I was like, hey, let's, you know, there was a romantic side to me back then. And, and, I, and we danced in Red Lobster. And we had, I mean, it was, it was cool. That, but you know what happened is that over time, the dates went from Red Lobster to the parking lot of Walmart. That's, that's what happened. Because those were the dates that I think were the most fun. Where, 
where we went, we would, go to, we would go to Walmart, we would get a big sandwich, and sometimes a jug of milk, or sometimes an IBC root beer, and that's right, right? I, yeah, it was IBC root beer, because uh, one time at Walmart, they carded me for that. I thought that was strange. But, but we, we got the IBC root beer, and then we went, we would sit on the back of my car in the parking lot, and eat a sandwich, and talk for hours. And sometimes those were some of my favorite dates. And I guess what I'm getting around to is what was the favorite date you ever went on? And it doesn't have to be something fancy. It could be that it was a great date because of who you were with. And that's really what it should be. It it could be that it was a great date because who was the focus of the date? You know, who was there with you when you were on the date? And so what we're going to be talking about, best date ever, uh, some of you are like, you know what, I'm done with that. I'm married. I don't go on dates anymore, which, by the way, I want you to repent of that if you're married and go on a date this week. If you don't hear anything else this, this, th- today, then, then hear this. This week, your job, your next step, it's not even on your connection card. God says to you today, go on a date with your spouse. But we're not getting along. Go on a date. Go talk it out. Go have a good time. Let, just, just enjoy one another. God wants you to keep dating. But you also know kids, and you know single people, and you know people in your life who need to hear what we're going to be talking about, some of these decisions that, that we decide beforehand that will help us have the best date ever. So I'm just going to jump right in, because what, I've, what I think you'll find is that this is going to kind of relate to everything we're going to do, but I want to jump right in and, and look at, uh, we're going to look at five decisions a person needs to make to have the best date ever. And decision number one is this. Some of you have already guessed it. Uh, decision number one is this, to pray for every potential date. Pray for every potential date. Now, some of you are going, yeah, I, I do that. God, give me a date. God, give me a date. God, it's like when I'm hunting, I'm going, God, give me an elk. God, give me an elk. And, and, and some of you are sort of in that place where, God, I just like a date. Uh, would you please give me a date? Now, that's not what we're talking about, though. We're not talking about just that. That's an okay prayer to pray. God, I'd, I'd like to find somebody that, that, that I could have in my life. That's a legitimate prayer, one that I think he wants to answer. But, but we also want to look at it from another angle. We want to look at it from, okay, well, once God does bring someone around, what do we do? We pray. God, and I think we pray some prayers, some different ones. We pray, God, uh, should I go with this person? You know, God, is this person someone that you would really want me to go with? Now, sometimes people don't want to pray that prayer because they already know the answer. They already know, no, this is not the person for me. And you need to pray, God, should I go? Ask him, do you want me to go? Parents and grandparents, by the way, I really want to encourage you with this thought. Some of you have little babies in your family. Begin praying now for their mate. I began praying for my kids the day they were born. God, if they're to have somebody in their life, will you prepare them now so that when they meet, they'll be the person that you want them to be so that they can have the best possible relationship they can have. Parents, pray that for your kids every day. Grandparents, pray that for your grandchildren. God, will you prepare the person who's going to be in their life and be their mate? Will you prepare them to be able to be God-honoring and and to be able to be encouraging to one another and blessing to one another? Will you prepare them to love my child the way that they should be loved? And and I just want to encourage you to start praying that so that when the time comes and they pray that prayer, God, should I go? That when that person is there, you'll be like, yeah, they should go. Yeah. Yeah, go, because we've been praying that person up. We've been putting that person uh, before God all along, and, and they're ready now. But, but then when they pray, God, should I go, and it's not the right person, you'll be able to say, no, 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 that's not the one. That's not the one God wants you to go with. Number two, pray this. Pray, God, please go with me. It doesn't end. You don't stop praying. You pray, oh, yeah, oh, I'm going to go on this date with this person, and, and God, you just stay back. You stay back because, because I'm going to go do my thing and you stay here and, and you do your thing and, and we'll just separate ways right now. No, we, we pray, God, will you go with me? 
And what you'll find is when you pray, God, will you go with me on this date? You'll probably, you'll probably act different than you would have otherwise. You might do things a little differently than you would have done otherwise. And, and here's another pray, uh, prayer that we ought to pray. God, should I go again? God, do you want me to go again? Is this person someone that you'd want me to be with again? And so we pray before every date. And, and one of the reasons we pray is so that we can give God our heart and, and put our hearts in his hands and protect our heart and, and, and keep our heart safe while we're on that date. God, go with me. God, protect me. God, take care of me. In Proverbs 4, 23, it says this, Guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. And when we date, we're putting ourselves in a place where our heart is vulnerable, where our heart might be something that will get pushed or pulled or, or go in one direction or another, and we want to guard our heart, and God wants to guard our heart, so he says, invite me to come, and I will come and, and guard you. So number two, the second decision we need to decide, we need to decide to pray when we go on dates. And, and number two is this, we need to prioritize godly standards. Prioritize godly standards. Now I don't know about you, but, but I feel like I'm not alone in saying that, that we all have standards when it comes to who we want to be with. We all have standards, and sometimes those standards are superficial, but I'm not going to say they're not, they're not important. Because they are. We have standards. Standards like, am I attracted to this person? Do I like this person? Uh, do we have similar hobbies, similar likes, similar dislikes? Do they have talents that sort of capture my heart and captivate my heart? Do they, do they look a certain way that, that makes me feel good? And, and, and do I look a certain way that makes them feel good? And, and I don't know why Carrie said yes, because it's just not two ways there. But we have standards, and those standards are superficial. They're legitimate. I, I think God gave us all likes and dislikes, and, and he gave us all different personalities and talents and things that attract us, and that's why there's such variety in the world, because God gave us all something different that, that attracts us. But when it comes to those standards, there are standards that are underneath the surface that are deeper, that are more important. That so often what happens is we only judge the, the superficial standards and we never really tend to hold on to the more important ones. And I want to give you a couple. I recently, I recently remembered this one preacher I heard one time, his father, he was talking about what he taught his kids. And he would always say to his kids, three rules. When you bring someone home, i got three questions. Do they love Jesus? Do they go to a good church? And do they have a job? Those are the three rules. they got to love Jesus, and then they have to go to a good church because you can say you love Jesus, but be inactive, and, and what you say isn't really quite true. And then they can't be a lazy bum who's going to want to live on my couch. You might have heard the old story about the parents. The parents whose son or daughter brought home a, a young man, and, and the parents would ask the young man, what are you going to do for a living? Where are you going to be? What are you going to do? And, and the young man just always said, God will provide. God will provide. Well, what, what do you have planned in five years? God will provide. What, do you, what are you going to do for school? God will provide. And after a while, the young man left, and, Dad's wife asked him, well, what do you think about this young man? He said, I don't know, but he thinks I'm God. <laughs> got to love Jesus, got to go to a good church, and got to have a job. But let me talk about some, a couple of real ones. A co I mean, I've been saying that to my kids, you know, kind of tongue-in-cheek, kind of serious, but, but here are some real, real issues that you want to make sure you deal with, like this one. There's a spot to write this on your notes. Is this a person of faith? And you might, you might put in the margin over there, person of the same faith, person of the same 
hope, the same faith, maybe even the same level of faith. Because when you talk about a person that you're going to want to be with the rest of your life, you're talking about, are we going to be on the same page on one of the deepest, one of the most important parts of who a person is? And are we, are we people of the same faith? I, I know that's not really a popular one today. A, a popular, it's not a popular thing to think about. But if you're talking about someone you're going to date who potentially might be someone you spend the rest of your life with, you might be attracted to them for all the superficial things, but if they don't have a substantial thing that you have in common, a a thing that will change the course of your life, I, I mean, if you're a person of faith who wants to walk with Jesus, You want to be someone who puts Jesus first in your life. You want to be someone whose faith is important. You want to be with someone who will encourage you to have faith, encourage you to take steps of faith, who will hold your hand, go to church with you, who will encourage you in your faith. And you might be dating somebody who wants to discourage you from faith, who wants to trip you up from faith, who wants to draw you away from faith, who wants to make you make it hard for you to have faith. Now I know sometimes people get married and they end up in situations like that. But if you're dating, you could avoid a whole lot of trouble. If you would just ask that question at the beginning, is this person on the same page with my faith? It's not impossible for a marriage to work with two people of a different faith or even two people at a different place in faith, but it's a lot harder. And there are a lot of husbands and wives today who wish their spouse was with them that would say, and don't do it, who would say amen. And you young people, or some of you who are compromising, wondering, you know, well, there isn't anybody of the same faith. This is Vernonia. You know how hard it is to find another Christian kid, or, uh, another Christian girl. You know how hard it is to find someone of the same faith. I know. But God says, trust me, I want to give you the best life ever. He wants you to have the best relationships ever. And so he wants to come into your life and help you. And if you just trust him, he will guide you down a path that will help you experience what he wants for you the best ever. In in 2 Corinthians 6.14, it says this. Don't become partners with those who reject God. How can you make a partnership out of right and wrong? That's not a partnership, that's a war. It's, is light best friends with the dark? And and that's what happens. I I mean, if somebody has faith and and they're looking at someone who they want to date and they have all these standards and all these priorities... Would you really want to be with somebody who inside they're always wishing you were someone else? And if you're a person with no faith, would you really want someone who's saying, I want to put Jesus first? And would you want that battle to always be there? And so I would encourage you, young people, as you think about who you're dating, that's the first question you ought to be asking. Even before, are they cute? Even before, Oh, have you ever heard them sing? You know, even before all the things that might captivate your heart, decide now the thing I'm going to look for first is do they have the faith that I have? And and the next one is this, do they have integrity? Are, Are they a person who is what they say they are? Now, I know we're talking about dating, and so we're talking about a whole lot of pretending. Am I wrong? I mean, you see a young man, and he's dating, and he becomes like the best car salesman you ever saw. I'm sorry to those of you who are car salesmen. <laughs> but, but, but he will sell himself. And, and you see a young lady, and, and she's dating, and she will sell herself. And, and what you want to decide is, I am not interested in compromising. I'm going to look, is this really a person who has integrity? Are they on the outside what they're saying, or on the inside what they're showing to be on the outside? I I can think of a couple people over the years who here at church, like I know they're dating when they show up to church. Because all of a sudden, they show up to church with a new lady or a new man. And you know what they're doing? 
They're bringing them to church to make them think they have a relationship with Jesus. Because the person they're dating goes to church wherever they live. And that's not integrity. That's, that's pretending to be something you're not. And you won't want someone who does that with you. You want someone who's going to be honest who's going to to really reveal who they are and be honest about it. And and you're going to see some flaws, you're going to see some good, but you want someone who's going to be honest and have integrity. In 1 Corinthians, it says this, Don't be fooled. Bad company corrupts good character. And you want to remember that verse. Just remember that. Bad company corrupts good character. The relationships we have actually guide our life and create who we are and we want to make sure we're surrounding ourselves with people who have integrity number three this one ought to be fun because i'm going to say some things that i always my ears always turn red when i talk about this in front of people this is why some of you would never want to be a preacher because we get we're going to talk about sex just a little bit And here's what we're going to say. We're going to say, first off, number three, uh, place physical boundaries before the date. Before the date. Place physical boundaries before the date. Decide ahead of time what you're going to not do and what you're going to not be before the date. Because often, if you don't set it before the date, then you go on the date, you get in the heat of the moment, and you do stupid. You know why I know you do stupid? Because I've been to logging roads, and I've seen needles and used condoms all over the place. And I've been under the bleachers, and I know what's under those bleachers. And that happens because someone didn't decide before the date what they were going to do, and then they regret, they regret what happened on the date. And so here's what we will say. You want to experience God's best then honor God with the physical part of your relationship. Decide ahead of time. You're going to do things God's way. Now, I know that's countercultural because our culture has sort of taken sex and decided that our culture is the God of sex. We decided that our culture was going to define sex, that our culture was going to define who could have sex, that our culture was going to sort of tell us what's acceptable and what's not acceptable to say about sex. And you know what has happened? A whole lot of confusion. People are confused all over the place. They're so confused today that a young man can abuse women in sports and and call it okay because he was confused about what sex he was. In any other time in our history, that would have been considered abuse. But now we have young men wrestling young women, beating them up, young men in women's sports uh, uh, bullying them, and it's okay because we're in a confused culture. But God is not confused, and he's not a God of confusion. God made it simple. You are a man, and you have these parts. You are a woman, and you have these parts, and the two fit. And a man and a man, oh, there's no compatibility physically. A woman and a woman, there's no, it doesn't work the same. And God created it simple. And he said, I'm going to create this, and the two will come together, and it will be this beautiful binding for the rest of their life. By the way, God created sex. He made it fun. He made it enjoyable. And because Carrie's not in here, I can say, I love it. He made it. He created it. And I love it in the context that he created it to be in. And that's okay. It should be that way. My daughters are like, I really don't want to be here right now. <laughs> I heard one, one youth minister once said, somebody's got to be the poster child for sex done right. And I volunteer. God created this thing to be binding, to be this beautiful connection between a husband and a wife who will be together forever. And when the world creates confusion out of it, when the world at school says, hey, 
you, fourth grader, fifth grader, sixth grader, go ahead and, and, and have fun. When the world says to you, you high schoolers, just, you know, kids will be kids. When the world says to you, go ahead and try before you buy. Move in. Take all the benefits without any of the commitments. When the world confuses it like that, let's look at the results. Confusion, depression, anxiety, early divorce. And I just want to say to the culture that we live in, how's it going? You decided to be the god of sex. Look at the fruit. Look where it's taken us. People are hurting. People are, pe people are so hurting and so confused. And we just want to say, let's bring God's way back. Let's go to his word, and he says to us, listen, honor me with your body and, and glorify me with your body. In fact, in, in Romans 6.13, it says this, do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Just one little example of the confusion it's created in our culture. A study was done. A study was done of, of, of husbands and wives who had had sex with other people before they were married. And, and here's just an interesting little thought. That 32% of the men who were surveyed said that the person they're married to now was not their best sexual partner. And men, it's worse for you. 55% of the women said that the men that they're married to are not their best sexual partner. And I guess what I'm wondering is, do you really want to be with someone for the rest of your life who's always going to look back and compare you to someone else? Who's always going to look back and compare you to what they did before? And even if it's just for that reason, Decide right now that that's not going to be a part of your dating relationships. That you're going to put boundaries down and say, I'm not going to cross this boundary. And maybe you put those boundaries in your head, but it's good to just go ahead and say them. Hey, I'll hold your hand, but we're not putting hands anywhere else. Uh, we, might, we might get a little, I had a professor who is like 85, and he said, I never kissed my wife until we were married. And then he got a big smile. He goes, because we weren't married yet. And it was kind of cute to see this older fella just kind of saying that. But, but you might have to decide, you know, how far will that go? And, and, and at what point are we going to say, not past this point? We're going to decide ahead of time how physical we're going to be ahead of time. In Proverbs 27, 12, it says this, A prudent person uh, foresees danger and takes precaution. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequence. And, and the word simpleton means fool or idiot. It actually says it in the Bible. You're a moron. If you see danger ahead and you just tread on forward, and what he's saying here is we don't want to be simpletons. We want to do something about making sure we guard ourselves. And so we're going to guard ourselves and say this is as far as we're going to go. Number four is this, predetermine the goal of the date. Why are you going on a date? There, there are two different ways people look at dating. Uh, one is uh, date, who cares about a mate? I'm going on dates. I'm just going to have a good time. I don't feel like I can go the weekend without getting together with somebody and hooking up. And, and that's sort of the way some people kind of live on. But, but you're going to sort of, you're going to miss God's best for you if you approach life that way, if you approach dating that way. Instead, the question should be date to discover your mate. You know, who is God putting in my life? That's the reason we do it, to find who God wants to bring into our life. We date to discover our mate. In Ephesians 5.17, it says, Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants to do. In other words, you're not just going to date thoughtlessly. 
But you're going to date and ask questions like, is this a person God wants me to be with? Is this a person God's bringing into my life? And so we pray. We, we prioritize godly standards when we, when we choose who we're going to be with. We place boundaries down, and, and we predetermine, why am I doing it? And then the last one is this. I'm going to put my trust in God. I'm going to put my trust in God. I mean, we should be doing that no matter where we are in life. Because God wants, God wants us to trust in him. He wants us to get to a place where we're trusting in him and, and walking with him. In Proverbs 3, 5, it says, Trust the Lord with all your heart and do not depend on your own understanding. Don't force it. Don't try to, try to force what, what God is, it might be trying to do in your life. Sometimes we take things into our own hands because we don't trust God. We compromise. We, we say, well, you know, I mean, there's not too many Christian guys out there, and so I'm just going to go with you, I guess. And I'll probably make him feel good when you just go with him and choose to go with him. Uh, oh, there's not a lot of Christian gals, and, and, and you know, she won't, she won't really love me unless we cross the line here. And, and so I go ahead and cross the line. Oh, Man, we're living together now. I don't know how I would make it right. I'm not really ready for marriage, but I don't really know how it would all work out if I moved out. And, and people say that kind of stuff because they're not trusting in God. Because here's the deal. You decide to do what God wants you to do, and he will provide a way. He always does. You decide to walk with God, obey God, and put his word first in your life, and he always shows us, as we're doing it, what, what he wants us to do and where he wants us to go. I recently had a conversation with a young lady who was living in a sinful situation, and she wasn't willing to change or repent because she said, I don't know how I'll make it. I don't know how, how it's going to work out if I don't do what I'm doing. I think the real reason is she wanted to keep doing what she was doing, but that's not an excuse because God will provide. If she decided to do what God wanted her to do, God would provide. God would take care of the situation. He would take care of her. But she tried to take it into her own hands rather than trust in God. And so we want to trust in God. We want to put our hope in him. In Matthew 6, 32 to 33, it says this, Your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. God knows what you need. He knows your loneliness. He knows that, that there's someone you might need in life. He knows, he knows all your needs. So he says, seek the kingdom of God above all else. Live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Trust in him. He wants you to have the best relationships ever. And he has someone in store for you. I remember as a young man, I remember when I had first come to Christ and, and the preacher was talking about stuff like that. And I remember sitting there and, and it was a small church at that time, smaller than our church. And, and I remember looking around because he's talking about dating Christian girls. And I looked around, I'm like, I'm not attracted to any one of these girls in this church. And... And, and I just don't know how God is going to make this happen. But you know what? 3,000 miles away, God was preparing Carrie for our first date. 3,000 miles away, Carrie was living with her folks in ministry, and, and we met in the middle in Joplin, Missouri. I didn't know how God was going to work it out, but that day in church, I decided I'm going to do this God's way. And God blessed. And you know, God will do that for you. If you would decide to do it his way. If you decide to go his way, to trust in him, and he will provide. And we're going to, we're going to finish up this message right now and move into a time where we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And what we're going to do is we're going to think about this God who not only wants us to have the best date ever, but he wants to date us. I know that sounds kind of funny, but we go back to the Old Testament, and one of the things it says in Scripture, it says that God has, God has loved us with this everlasting love, with this everlasting kindness. And the word that it uses to describe his everlasting love is the word that we would give us the picture of the way that a young man tries to woo 
a woman who he loves. And we think about all the ways God has reached out to us. Think of the way that he has given us his son, where he went to a cross and he reaches his arms out wide and he says to us, I love you. I care about you. He created you, he made you, and he has loved you even before you ever chose to love him back. You might even be here and you've never chosen to love him back. You've never chosen to say yes to him, but he's saying to you, I love you. I love you so much, I'm willing to reach across time. I'm willing to reach down into the world, become one of you. I'm willing to die on a cross and bleed for you so that your sins could be forgiven, so that you could have a new relationship with me. You know, we've talked about a lot of things this morning, and and, and some of the things we've talked about, I have a feeling there are a lot of us who would say we have regrets of choices we made during those dating times and dating years. Maybe some of you are here and you have regrets for things that you did yesterday. But I want to tell you, God is a God new starts he's a God who loves you so much that he's willing to give you his life on that cross in order to pay for a new life for you you might be here and you might think man I messed up sexually you might think I I messed up and I've made some choice I let the world confuse me and I've done gone the world's way You might be here and you might think, well, I've gone through a divorce and I'm struggling and I made mistakes. The cross is a place all of us can go. And Jesus says, I want to give you a new start from here on out. I want to forgive you. I want to give you grace. I want to wash you by the blood of Christ. And the Lord's Supper is a time where we just think about that, where we put our minds towards that and we say to Jesus, thank you for your loving kindness. Thank you for loving me like a boyfriend never did, like a husband never did, like a father never did. Thank you for loving me the way you love me. And so what we're going to do is there's going to be some trays that will be passed. Uh, These young men are going to bring these trays up and one of the trays has little pieces of bread on it. Take one of those and eat it This represents the body that was broken on the cross for us. So take a piece of bread, eat it, pass the tray on, the next person will take it. And then take one of the trays with the juice on it. Take it, it's grape juice. It represents the blood that Jesus shed on the cross for us. Take that and drink it. And when you eat the bread and drink the cup, I'd like to encourage you, just think about the loving kindness Jesus has shown us. The way that he has tried to draw us as a young man trying to draw a woman who he loves. And even us tough guys can get a soft heart to that and say, Jesus, thank you. And then as the trays are being passed, just take time and quietly in prayer thank God for his love. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that we have the opportunity to celebrate the Lord's Supper together, to bring honor and glory to you, to bring a blessing. God, I I thank you that we get to come around this table and sit at your feet, to sit at the cross. God, I thank you that we have a chance to, to see the kind of love that you have loved us with. And God, I pray that that every one of us will learn from you and your love and that all of us would grow in our relationships because of the love that you show us. God, I pray that you will bless this time of the Lord's Supper. And it's in Jesus' name each of us said, amen.